Hello and welcome to A Day in the Life. This is program number 113 in our series. And we always like to begin our programs by thanking those who make this program possible. I want to thank our season sponsor, uh, Kathy Bales, Michelle Deschamps, and Jeff Holloway of RBC Dominion Securities. We're very grateful for their continuing support throughout each season. Our sponsor for this particular program is a bit unusual in that the sponsor is anonymous, but I want you to know that the sponsor is someone who both our guest and I know. And he's a wonderful supporter of the Midland Cultural Center and a, a great friend. And so I just want to anonymously thank him for his support of the program. Well, our guest today is a fascinating individual. He has been described as one of the most influential power brokers in Canada. He's been called the King of Bay Street. He's one of the most influential people in the country. He has been named as Communicator of the Year. He has a, a remarkable rags to riches story. He's now leading an anti-racism movement, and he is the newest dragon on the Dragon's Den. Welcome, Wes Hall. Fred, I'm uh, so glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much. I've been looking forward to this, Wes. Your, your story is a fascinating one, and I can hardly wait to share it with our viewers. Let's begin where it began. Um, tell us about where you were born when you were born and the circumstances under which you were born? Well, I, uh, I have a picture of the house that I actually keep in my, in my office on Bay Street, but uh, now that everybody's working virtually, it's in my virtual office uh, here at home, and I'm gonna show your viewers uh, what that place looks like. Okay. So that, is the, uh, that is Golden Grove St. Thomas, and that house, uh was uh where my grandmother raised uh myself and uh, my siblings and uh, uh cousins and so on it's uh it's really literally a tin shack and uh it's built on five foot stilts and uh that's where my humble beginning was now wes you very at a very young age both your mother and your father disappeared out of your life tell us about that yeah so my grandmother i recognize her as we call her mama because uh, she raised us and uh, but the way that uh, I was told the story I was about uh, uh, 18 months old and myself and uh, my sister who was two years older than me and a brother who was uh, a year younger almost a year younger than me was abandoned in this house uh, not too far away from my grandmother lived and uh, we were there for a few days and um, uh, we're crying and uh, a neighbor uh, came to check on us to see what was going on and found out that we we're by ourselves. And uh, that neighbor actually went to the plantation. My grandmother at the time was working on the banana plantation. And uh, the neighbor went to the plantation to get my grandmother. And that's how I started to live with her. Your grandmother's name is Julia Vassal? Julia Vassal, yeah. Vassal. And you call her mama. Tell us about her. I'm telling you, she was a fascinating, fascinating woman. She died at 97 years old yeah. and she worked manual labor her entire life. So she worked in three places. Uh, she worked on the sh sugar uh, cane plantation, depending on the season, banana plantation and coconut plantation. But think about just those places. And the, the house that I showed uh, your viewers, uh, Fred, that's actually the plantation house that the plantation owner would give the workers to raise their family. So that was a two bedroom place. I have 14 brothers and sisters, by the way. And, uh, and by the time my mom was 25 years old, she had seven children. Wow. And, and pretty much all those kids were given to my grandmother uh, to raise. And uh, so when you think about this woman, you know, she was 60 years old when I went to live with her. So this is my experience with her when uh, she was past 60. And I could remember going to the banana plantation with her and, uh, and there she is just cutting the bananas and it's got sap all over it. And she did that for hours. 
And then I remember going to the sugarcane plantation and they would burn, burn the sugarcane and to uh, get rid of, uh, you know, to make it easier to, uh, to, to cut down. Grab one with the machine, with her hand, the top, the machete on the roof and, and the root of it. And then she would uh, fling it up on the top and then take the top off. And then she would put it in a pile. And she did that for hours, bent over for hours. Think about that wow. in your 60s. And that's how hard you had to work. And she lived until she was 97 years old. So that's my fun memories of her. She was just this industrious, hardworking woman. I read that you called her a giant. I don't think physically she was, but in your eyes, very much so. What did she teach you, Wes? What, what, what life lessons did you take away from her? I never heard her complain about anything. Like when my mom would, didn't show up or my dad didn't come back uh, or they didn't assist her, she didn't take it out on us. You know, sometimes like when you, when there's a divorce, for example, in today's society, and the kids sometimes get the brunt of it because one of the spouse would blame the kid for the action of the other person, right? And uh, so my grandmother never really resented her daughter, and not just my mom, but other, she had two other daughters that left their kids with her as well, right? And that's why I had cousins there with me, right? And she never blamed them, right? And, uh, and my, my grandfather was an alcoholic and she kicked him out in the 70s. I remember, you know, she's like, I don't want you around my grandkids in that way. So she kicked him out and she's like, I'll take care of these kids. So when I reflect on just the life she lived and the, ex the example she gave me, I just felt that I couldn't fail no matter what. I just couldn't fail. And that's the reason why I kept pushing myself as hard as I do. Now, Wes, I wanna, I wanna hearken you back to uh, your teenage years in, in uh, your homeland. What were your what were your expectations of your own life at that point? What did you think would happen? I had no expectation. In fact, my expectation was so low you can trip over it. Okay, <laughs> because expectation number one. So my mom came back into my life when I was eleven years old, and she brought me to live with her in the city on the decree of my father. My father apparently got in touch with her and said, "Well." You're no longer with Wes, we well, gotta bring him to live with you. So she brought me to live with her in a city at 11 years old. At 13 years old, she threw me out and said, you're on your own. So at 13 years old, I had to figure life out, right? Because I'm now in the city, I'm going to school and, uh, and I, have to, I have to support myself, I have to feed myself, right? So I felt that my life would be, you know, haggling with people in the markets, you know, selling peanuts and popcorn because that's what uh, people did back then and do little odd jobs to keep myself going. But I never really expected that one day I would actually leave that environment at all. I felt that I was gonna live there. I was gonna do those odd jobs and I was gonna die doing those odd jobs. And I may have a bunch of kids because that's what everybody else did. They had all these kids. And like a lot of fathers uh, my age at the time and still do, you know, they were like active sexually. So, uh, and they would father a child and they'll move on. Just like my mom had those seven kids from different men, seven different men. And, you know, so that's the tradition. So I felt that I would just settle into that tradition. But something happened when you were 16. What was that? I... I got in, in touch with my dad and uh, I don't know how I got in touch with him. I, clearly through my, my mom, I got his details because my mom wouldn't share his contact details with me. And, and I somehow got a hold of it and I connected with him and he responded. And then he said, I'm going to bring you to Canada to live with me. So he was in Canada. He time. was in Canada. He came, he left Jamaica when he was 24 years old in 1970. So I was one year old when he left Jamaica. I was born in 1969. So he left Jamaica to, uh, and he was a professional cricketer in Jamaica. So he plays professional sports, but he felt that he could have a better life for himself, leaving that village and going to, uh, to Canada. And again, at 24 years old, he was a young man, 
right? At 24 years old and you're a professional, anything, you just want to have fun. Like, and there's like, especially when you're a cricketer, ladies were just lining up from all the places you travel because you're the person, you're the man, especially he was a fast bowler and the fast bowler was the, was like the quarterback, you know? And so he was like, he had to pick it a litter, literally. And uh, so he fathered a number of kids before he left Jamaica, myself and my, and, 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 and some others. And then he left now, but then he remembered, he remembered that he had obligations in Jamaica. And when I connected with him, he said, I want you to come to live with me in Canada. And uh, I never thought it would happen. I, I never, I, until the day I stepped off the plane at Lester B. Pearson International Airport, I never thought it was real. Now there's a, there's a funny story, Wes, about your, your early days in school. Tell our viewers about, uh, about where they put you in school. Well, you know, when I came to Canada, I had this very strong Jamaican accent. Like, you know, it was just strong. Can so, you give, can you give us an example of it? Can you still do it? Yeah, man, we can do it the same way like this, man. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, yes, I can do it the same way like this. Yeah. So that's you know, you know, so so I would be in there, and uh, and I thought I was speaking English, right? <laughs> so I'm sitting in class. They put me in this program. And, uh, and I'm sitting there going, nobody speak English in this class, <laughs> right? And uh, so I remember going home and I'm sitting there and I'm talking to my dad about it. And, and I said, yeah, nobody in the class speak English. <laughs> and, uh, and he's like, what do you mean by that? I said, I'm the only one who kind of speak English. And, uh, you know, because I thought I was speaking English. The, uh, the guidance counselor clearly didn't think I was speaking English, even though I was from an English speaking country. I was just speaking <laughs> English with a strong dialect. And uh, so he went, went into school and he said, uh, he found out that I was put in the ESL program, the English so sec as second language program. So you're learning English as a second language while it already is your first language. <laughs> well, sorry, it's, it's my so people are learning to pronounce the, of what a vowel was in class. <laughs> and I'm looking and going, man, school is pretty easy in this country, right? <laughs> I can breeze through this, no problem. And, uh, and then they took me out of ESL. And they put me into the general program. Back in the day, they called it general. They called it applied today. And uh, so you had advanced and general, advanced applied. They put me in the, uh, the general program. And I remember going back home later and said, wow, school is easy in Canada. Like, the, you know, everything is easy. The math is easy. The English is easy. All this. And my dad looked at it and said, it's, everything says G instead of A, advanced. He went back again. They go, OK, and they switched me out again. So, but if I didn't have somebody like my dad, who was very strong, right, I would be, first of all, I would be in ESL for the entire time until it took me out of it, right? And secondly, I would be in the general program through my entire high school. But what happens when you're in general program is that you dis it disqualifies you from university, yeah. right? So as a result of that, my career path and my track would be completely different as a result if I didn't have somebody like him that was uh, looking out for me and, and me not being curious and saying, wait a minute, there's something seem like it's not right here. Even though I was a brand new student, I came to Canada on the Friday and Monday I was in school. Yeah. So I had no time to acclimatize and to get to know kids. I just Friday, Monday, that was it. And then things weren't making sense to me and I tried to figure it out. Now, Wes, you, you wanted after high school to go to university, but there was a financial impediment. Yeah, you know, my, I moved out from my dad's place when I was 18, my senior year of high school. So I lived with my dad for two years. And he was just too strict because I was used to living on my own since I was 13 years old in Jamaica. And now I came into an environment where I was told what time dinner was, what time I had to be home from school, what time was bedtime. And it was just very, very hard for me to adjust. And, but my dad was a guy of structure. He wanted to make sure that we didn't get into trouble and we had structure. But for me, him being a father was too late for me, mm -hmm. right? Because I, I, I became an adult at 13 years old because I had to fend for myself. So between 13 and 16, I was fending for myself. I was calling my own shots. 
and now somebody else is calling it for me. So when I left, my dad said, you know, this guy is a bad seed. He's a bad apple. <laughs> and nobody in the family is allowed to communicate with him. He's on his own. And, and I'm not going to help him because now that he wants to be on his own, he's going to have to help himself. So when I finished high school and I applied to university, uh, I wanted to get the uh, OSAP and I applied for OSAP. But the problem with OSAP is the student loan program. You have to provide information on your family's income, my dad in that case. And he refused to provide the information. He said, you're on your own. And that's a typical Jamaican, uh, especially Jamaican men. When you leave home, you leave home. You just don't come back unless you come back to visit. But you don't come back to stay home and you don't come back for help, right? But if you leave on your own volition, uh, meaning like that, that's the consequence. But if you leave because you're now of age and you're moving on and you're going to get married, it's a different story. But once you leave prematurely, completely different conversation. So I was denied that loan from OSAP. And now I figured I, got, I have to work now. I have to make a living while I save enough money to send myself through school. So you're 18 years old and you're out looking for jobs. What kind of jobs does an 18 year old with a high school education get? Well, the first thing I realized very quickly was that uh, you had to look in a particular section of the newspaper because it was at the time when all these jobs were published in the newspaper, right? And the only section I was able to, I was qualified to look in was the general laborer section. That means we want someone who doesn't really have a brain who can just, you know, it, hopefully they have some must and they're strong, they can take direction and they just do what they're told. So that's the section I was looking in. So I cleaned offices, I was a dishwasher, I, uh, I was a chicken catcher. I, <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, Fred, it's, uh, it's interesting because when I look back at all those jobs that I've had, I did them very well. And I was proud because I was making money because I had an objective in doing these jobs. So, you know, but I realized very quickly that I didn't want to do these things for a living. Right. And when I and I realized that I didn't want to continue to look in the general labor section of the newspaper to find a job. Right. right. So we you know, so I wanted. So what does it take to look in the other sections, the skills section? And I realized that you need to educate yourself. And that's when I ch uh, changed path. So by the time you were 19, I understand you were working as a security guard for a while. Yeah. And then you ended up in a law firm. What was your yeah. job in the law firm? So I was a, so when I was a security guard, um, I didn't really want to do the job anymore. And, and a part of the job was, you remember back in the day, Regent Park was one of the toughest neighborhoods in the city of Toronto. It's very tough. Gangs, drugs, you name it. And a part of my job when there's a security alarm in that neighborhood was to go there with a flashlight to check out if there's a robbery and handle it. Now, I only had a flashlight as a weapon and I would be going there at two o'clock in the morning after there was a burglar alarm. And I figured that there's no future in that job because something's gonna happen to me because I'm not a big guy, I'm not a, I just like, but I would show up and I would be terrified looking in these corners and stuff like that because you have to check in everywhere you go. There's a, a, a point where you have to check and turn a key to show your bosses that you check the entire building because you can't just show up and go, things look good. You have to go through these different sections and you have to punch and punch and punch. And I go, no, I don't want to do this. So I was talking to friends and I said, listen, I want to leave the security guard business. And, uh, and, and a buddy of mine, uh, was offered a job at one of these at, at a law firm to be in the mailroom, and he said he turned he said no I already have a job he turned it down so he said but I have a, a buddy who's looking for a job his name is Wes here's his details I got a phone call, and uh, and I was hired over the phone to work in the mailroom of a law firm, and that's how I got on Bay Street. Now I understand that you were the only person in the mailroom who wore a suit and tie. Tell me why you did that. Well, you know, when I went there, I remember they told me, they hired me over the phone and then they told me to come in the next day to fill out uh, an official application. I, I got a job already, but you got to fill out an official application. It was in Commerce Court on the, uh, on the 13th floor of Commerce Court. I've never been to in an elevator uh, until then, right? 
and here I am in the financial district and I was wearing my security guard uniform, okay? Because yeah. I was coming from the night shift. And, uh, and I went in and I go up on the 13th floor and I'm sitting in this palatial reception area with beautiful art on the wall and everything. And then I see all these people walking with fancy business suits. Everybody was wearing a fancy business suit, everybody. And so I was like, pretty cool. So I went to Goodwill after that. And I said, I better get me a suit if I'm gonna work in this environment. What I didn't know was that in the mailroom, you don't need to wear a suit, <laughs> right? You, you know, you can, everybody was wearing jeans and t-shirt. I showed up in a suit and all these guys were laughing at me. And I said, you know what? They said, people are gonna mistake you for a lawyer. And I said, what's wrong with that? <laughs> and, and from that moment on, I wore a suit to work every day. Good for you, good for you. Now, the, the rest of your career path is fascinating, Wes, and I, I wish we had time to make each of the stops along the way, and we'll do that briefly. But uh, um, you, you, you use the opportunity from the law firm to get to further your education. Just briefly tell us about that. So what happened was that they had this program whereby if, you, um, if you're a full-time employee, you, the, the company will pay for you to take certain courses as it relates to what the company does. And uh, so I, I wanted to be in law. <laughs> I didn't want to be in the mailroom in law. I wanted to be practicing law. So I decided to take the law clerks program and uh, at George Brown College and the company paid for it. And, uh, and I, was, I didn't even know anything about it. It's because I'm a chatty guy and I chat up all these different people and they told me about the program and I looked into it and then check mark, got into it, applied, and I was able to successfully complete the course. And so you then went looking for jobs and law firms. Well, I was really, yeah, I wanted to work obviously in that firm. And one of the best piece of advice that I got from someone was, uh, from the person in the department that I wanted to work in, that uh, they wouldn't hire me in that department. And then I started to look for other positions outside that law firm. So I sent my resume to all the law firms on Bay Street. Right. Yeah. Now you you ended up getting a referral from a law firm to a position that uh, I I think had a big part to do with your trajectory in life. Tell us about how you got the job with uh, with Canwest Global. Well, it seems uh, first of all, Fred, uh, great questions. It seems like you know more about my story than I do. But uh, <laughs> so good, uh, good prods. Uh, so yeah. So we had. Uh, I applied for all these different law firms and uh, someone from Castles Brock and Blackwell called and said, uh, listen, we're not looking for anyone, but we have a client who is looking for someone in house. Do you mind us sending your resume to them? I said, absolutely. And then they did that. And then I was leaving uh, one day from, from the law firm and, uh, and the receptionist called me and said, there's a call for you. And, uh, and I went back and, you know, I was working late and, uh, and that's one of the benefits of working late because the call came in after hours, if I'd left on time, I wouldn't have gotten that call. She probably would have disregarded the message, who knows, right? And, uh, and I got the call and it was from Canvas Global. And, uh, and they were working and looking, and at the time Canvas Global was like building the NBC of Canada. And they were looking for someone to work in the global television studio as a corporate secretary and a law clerk to the general counsel. Okay. And they said, would you like to interview for that job? I had nothing to lose. I said, absolutely. And what, what do you think that position did and the people you worked with there, what did that do for your career? It changed my life. It, it literally changed my life. I was working for, I, I, I interviewed for the job. I got the job. I had no business getting the job, none. <laughs> but I, I'm a good talker, you know, and I always say, you know, you may not like me outwardly, but when you sit down and have a conversation with me, you're going to like me by the time we're done. <laughs> right. <laughs> and that's my attitude with anything in life. Right. Because there's sometimes when people rub people the wrong way just by looking at them. Right. And then you sit down with them and you realize that they're not bad. Right, I'm that kind of guy, right? And so when I sat in with the general counsel and the HR manager, and they were asking me all these questions, I just was just, answers were coming from all over, but I was charming about how I was presenting myself, right? Yeah. And, uh, and this gentleman, the general counsel that I would be working for was in his 
mid thirties. And he was, you can tell that he was ambitious. He wanted to go places. And I was drawn to that during the interview. So I wanted that job and I did everything to sell myself to them and, uh, and it worked. Good for you. Good for you. So my, uh, and, and I do know a lot about your, uh, about your story. I, I, I won't apologize for that. You spent four years with, with uh, CanWest Global. You then went to CIBC Mellon as a relationship manager and, and you had like almost a dozen people working for you, but there was one special guy there who I think our viewers would be interested in your experience with him. Do you mind telling us about him? So think about it, that I'm in my late, uh, my mid, I was about 27 at the time, right? And I went into this job and I had no, I had no experience. I didn't know what they did over there, right? <laughs> I, somebody told me about this job. I was at the time at Global where I did everything. I kind of wanted to explore a little bit more and take some other challenges on. And, uh, and this fellow said, hey, they're hiring at this, this bank. It was owned 50% by Mellon Bank and, and by CIBC Bank. And they do this thing called transfer agency. And I go, what is that? And uh, they describe it to me. And I go, might as well put my hat in the ring. So I applied for the position. And, uh, and they hired me to be a senior manager and 11 people reporting to me. And one of the gentlemen uh, reporting to me, he was 54 years old. And uh, he's been there forever. And this man would make my life miserable while I was working, while he was working for me. But I realized I'm a 27 year old uh, black man. He's a 54 year old white man, gray hair and everything. I figured how can I use him to my advantage and turn the relationship around? Again, remember I talk about, yeah. you may hate me before, but I'm gonna make you like me. Yeah. Well, I had to do that with him because I realized that bossing him around would not work because he didn't care. He was on his way out. He was retiring soon. He didn't really care. And the last thing he needed was a 27 year old man to be bossing him around. So I made, I turned him into the boss essentially. So we would go into meetings, Fred, and I let him take the lead in all the meetings. And I let him you know, I would ask him questions as if he was the boss. And when they refer things, they would refer to him and he would answer. And then he caught on. And then he said, okay, without a word, he started to teach and mentor me on the business. That's great. And I started to, and I learned the business. I learned so much from that man. Why? Because it was humble and I knew that he knew more than me and I needed him more than he needed me. That's, that's a great story, Wes. There's a lot of, lot of truth in that. From there, you went to Georgeson and you became a vice president of client development. And you saw an opportunity for the company. Tell us about what you saw, what you proposed and how they reacted. Well, first of all, uh, you know, let me, let me say this is, you know, uh, how I got the job at Georgeson, right? I was at CBC Mellon. I was content, but I remember that gentleman, Warren Jensen is his name. Warren came over to me after a couple, a few years into the job and Warren said to me, Wes, you're way too smart for this place. You need to leave. That's what he said to me, right? He said, you know, the guy went from hating me, <laughs> right? To now go, you're ready to leave now. Uh, you're wasting your talent here. And so the people at Georgeson came knocking on my door to come over. But I wanted my next job to be a vice president, and they didn't offer me a vice president position. And at the time, we lived in an 1,100 square foot home, my wife and I with two, with two kids, uh, three kids at the time, or two kids at the time. And, um, and, you know, we didn't even have furniture, right? I was, you know, so they called me at Georgeson and offered me the job to be director of business development. And my wife was on the, uh, the mattress because we didn't have a box spring, a proper bed. I was in my bedroom and I was answering the phone. We had no, uh, hardly any furniture in the house. And my wife, uh, I, you know, here's the conversation. 
thank you for the call, but um, I'm not interested. When you have the, and so I said, the next job, I told the gentleman that called me the CEO, the next job I wanna have is the vice president position. He said, I don't have the authority to give you that. And I said, well, why don't you give me a call when you have the authority? <laughs> and I turned the job down. My <laughs> wife went nuts laying on the bed. We don't even have furniture, right? I didn't say the pay wasn't right. I didn't say anything other than the title. And guess what? Two weeks later, he called me back and said, I have the authority. And wow. he hired me as vice president of business development for Canada. And when I went into the company, I was uh, uh, four people. And I realized this, the struggle that he had was he didn't he didn't have any vice president uh, other than one guy and all these other people were bucking for that position and when he hired me in that position all those people quit right so it was really stressful but we did so we did really really well and we didn't replace any of those people so as i'm going about my business at the company i kind of see opening for us to be better and bigger and bolder and so I went to my the management team and I said, we should get into this thing called activism. It didn't, we didn't say activism at the time because that's not what it was. Uh, there was no name like, you know, in Canada for it. But we, I said, investors are going to demand more of their, the companies that they invest in. And those companies must have better advisors helping them on dealing with these investors. And I go to them, we can be that, 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 that company. But we have to change the employee base of our company. To accommodate that then they go no no we're, we're fine we're good and i go okay and i left to start that company and that's how kingsdale started so you're 34 years old you start your own company on bay street you're specializing in something called strategic shareholder communications and i suspect that our viewers know about as little about that as i do <laughs> uh but the company grows you end up with uh more than 50 employees. Wes, we could spend the rest, rest of the program talking about the incredible successes you've had. And I mean that quite sincerely. I mean, it's the companies that you have represented, uh, it's a who's who of Bay Street and in some cases of Wall Street. But I wanna move on with your permission to mm -hmm. something that I know means a lot to you. Um, I wanna begin by talking about some of your personal experiences with racism. And I, I, I want to lead up to your activism, but, but first of all, I want to just that tell, tell me in business, what kinds of examples of systemic racism you would have experienced? You know, I remember the first time I've, I've never, first of all, let me say this. I've never recognized the fact that I was black until well into my career because I never used it as an obstacle and say, I didn't, this didn't happen to me because I'm black. Okay. I was 34 years old in the, uh, uh, in the financial services sector, running my own company. And, uh, and the boardrooms were white, old white men. Yeah. I never really thought that that was an obstacle to me, even when I went to all the banks with my business plan and they all turned me down. I never questioned why they turned me down. I never questioned the fact that they go, wait a minute, you're black. You're going to go into all these white boardrooms and you're going to tell them that you're going to help them to deal with activism and all these different things that doesn't even exist yet. And by the way, they have their investment bankers and lawyers that can help them with those things. I never really thought about that, right? I just felt that they turned me down because they couldn't recognize a good business idea when they saw one, right? So, so here I am, kind of figure it out, and then that so that would be my first experience. But I didn't know that, and then I was dealing with, uh, I had this big deal, and it was almost impossible for a firm like mine to get a deal that size. It was a big, it was the biggest merger in Canadian history. It was two thousand and six. And it was when those all those mining deals, copper and nickel and everybody was just buying everything. And I had the deal to not only manage the, the shareholder base and get in the shareholders to support the deal, but my job was to actually pay out the funds to the investors. So they would hand the funds to Kingsdale and Kingsdale would pay it out. And the payment the total funds were $20 billion, okay? <laughs> And a part of the deal that I have 
when you distribute that much money, you get a percentage of what you distribute, okay? But I needed a banking partner. And I went to my bank and I said to them, you know, my guy, and I said, hey, we're gonna, I'm getting this deal and I need your help. And they go, okay, let me bring all the senior persons in. I brought them in and Fred, they treated me like I was a nobody. That's not possible. They would never get somebody like you to do this deal. And, uh, and why wouldn't they use our firm? Because we have a sister company that does all these things. Why would they use your firm? It was just, they spoke down to me. And then we set up, my guy knew this. So my guy said, okay, Wes, we're gonna set up another meeting. And we came up with a strategy for the other meeting. And the strategy was that I'm gonna use this gentleman who was in his fifties, gray haired, white man, former investment banker. He's gonna front as if this is his company and I'm his employee. Oh, wow. And we set up a new meeting and they came into the boardroom and he started to talk about this deal. And he was, we just got this deal. We want you as a banking partner. We got everything we asked for, everything. And that's how the deal happened, right? Now- But that's a good I, news, bad news story. It's good news, bad news. And that's what I, and I like telling the story because we go, we have a system that treats certain people a certain way. And we can continue to fight against that system unsuccessfully, or we can use it to our advantage based on our understanding of how the system works, right? That issue is systemic racism. Why? Because they just couldn't see a black man running a firm like this, getting a deal this size, but they could see a white man, middle-aged white man, getting a deal this size, working, running a firm like this, right? The system tells them that that's how you need to behave. That's how you need to think. So me knowing that, let me use the system to my advantage. And you know what, Fred, on that deal, it was three years after I started Kingsdale, we made like $10 million on that deal, right? Could you imagine a fledged and low firm? We get the biggest deal in the history of the company, and that's the fees that we're gonna get in that small firm. And all I had to do is to come up with a little strategy by pretending that I am not the owner of the firm, right? I just have to just check my ego, check my ego that, you know, so I always use an expression. I never let my ego get in the way of me making money ever. <laughs> <laughs> now, Wes, you've had, you've had experience experiences where, where, where racism was more blatant. And, and I know you've had some in the community. I know you live in a, yellow brick mansion in, in Rosedale and, and with all the trappings of all the success you've had. But there's an incident where you and your wife wrote jogging that just that joggles me. Can you tell that story? Well, you know, the um, so and there's there's Fred, I, we, that could be a whole volume in terms of the what I experience as a, because the more successful you are as a black man, the more racism you experience. And when I say that to people, they're like, what do you mean? because we're always in positions that we're the only one when you're successful, right? The hotel you stay at, you know, the cars that you buy or that you drive, you know, the stores that you shop in, it's always like, well, we don't really see customers like you here. So you can't be a real customer, yeah. you know? So I was out jogging with my wife and, uh, and somebody just stopped her. Hey, you know, can I use your personal trainer one day? You know, or what I would get is uh, people would come and ring the bell and uh, to work on the house and they go, go get Mr. Hall. Or they would stop and say, oh, are you the security guard for the property? Or I would pull up in my, in my fancy car at Four Seasons to have lunch with a client. And when I get out, somebody gave me $20 to valet their car for them. You know, so, so, so it's, it's to the point where it gets so comical that when friends are with me, we kind of, okay, here's what's gonna happen now yeah. and we would wager on it and we would be right a hundred percent of the time but it's appalling it is appalling because none of my neighbors experience that no you know so what started and you're going to talk we're going to talk about activism in terms of um uh racial equity and so on uh later but uh one of those experiences was really what started this whole thing and got people behind me because I was jogging through this neighborhood 
And uh, this was a year ago uh, before George Floyd was murdered. And I was jogging through the neighborhood and a white woman fell in front of me. And I hesitated to help her. And I, and I expressed that story in the op-ed in the Globe and Mail. And, uh, and the reason why I hesitated was because I'm in a white neighborhood and uh, she may have been disoriented. I'm jogging without any identification. And then I'm over there trying to help her and she's fighting me off. My neighbors were white, seeing a black man fighting with this white woman, called the police who was white. Next thing you know, I have no identification. I, I swear that I live in a neighborhood and I go, I don't think so. We're gonna take you down to, uh, to the precinct until we figure it out, yeah. right? So that, even though I'm a resident of this neighborhood for so long, that crossed my mind for me to stop before I'm automatically going to help that person, yeah. right? And, and I think that's where the issue lies, whereby the system gear us to think a certain way, black people, white folks, people of color, indigenous people, and uh, it's not people who are being racist that, you know, that person who may have called the police seeing me doing that, they're not racist, but they're not used to seeing somebody like me in the neighborhood. Yeah. Wes, you, you tell a story about driving your red convertible Ferrari in downtown Toronto and a car stopping beside you and offering you something. I don't know whether to laugh or cry when I hear that story, but tell it. Well, a lot of people laugh and cry while they're laughing, you know, but it's actually, uh, you know, so I was driving, uh, I have a, a, a beautiful Ferrari 450, it's one of the cars that I drive and, uh, and I'm very proud of it. And I was going to a meeting with my banker and uh, the meeting was across the street from my office, my, my office at, King's, uh, at the Exchange Tower. And I'm driving and this fellow was walking on the sidewalk, two guys in business suits and the traffic was slow. And then one of the guy came over and, uh, and hand me his business card. And he said, I'm a criminal lawyer in the city of Toronto. If you're looking for a lawyer, give me a call. And, <laughs> and you know, and it was like, it was just, and I'm sitting there going, you know, like, I think he thinks I'm a drug dealer, right? And, uh, and it's like, I'm in Bay Street. I, I was wearing a business suit. I was wearing a business suit. I was going into a meeting with my bank. And, uh, and that is the response that I got. And by the way, you know, Fred, it was at, at, like the year, the week before that, the two weeks before that, I was on the cover of the report on Business Magazine as the fixer, right? So I, I went to my office and I autographed a copy of the magazine and I, and I sent it to his office and said, if you're in the market for one of the top advisors for public company CEO in Canada, give me a call, <laughs> West Hall. <laughs> I never heard from That's beautiful. That's a great story. So I want to get serious for a moment. Uh, last year, there was an event occurred that the whole world heard about. Uh, an unarmed black man in the state of Minnesota was shot. George Floyd was his name. We all know his name now. That had a particular impact on you, Wes, that I'd like you to share with our viewers. Yeah, Fred, I, um, I was not paying attention to the news back May 2020 because there was a succession of things happening to black people, like really in a row, almost within a week. There was that gentleman that was in Central Park that uh, the woman called the police and said, a black man is attacking me. So that was in the news. There was a gentleman that was jogging through the neighborhood, a black man jogging through a neighborhood and he was stalked and shot by, by two, actually they found out later on it's three people that did it and, uh, and he was killed. And, uh, and, then, and then George Floyd happened right after that. And so somebody came to me because it was busy because we're now in the middle of COVID dealing with all these things, you know, the economy is shut down and businesses are shut down. We have to now manage, right? So everybody was hunkered down and managing. I'm on the board of Sick Kids, I'm on the board of Toronto International Film Festival, I'm on the board of Pathways to Education. I'm running all these different companies that I own now. So we were all in crisis mode. Somebody came to me and said, have you seen the video? Yes, I have, I, I responded, because I thought it was the one with the person jogging through the neighborhood and got shot. And that just shows how callous we become to the, the activity. And I said, no, there's one that's more egregious. It's the George Floyd one, you should take a look at it. And I looked at it, Fred, and literally I dropped everything I was doing. And I sent a note to all the boards I was on and I said, I have to take a mental week off. And I sent a note to my colleagues and I said, 
I cannot continue to function as if I never saw that video. And I didn't know what to do after I took that mental week. And that's when I sat down and wrote the op-ed in the Globe and Mail and I used the experience of me jogging through the neighborhood and saw the white woman fell and, and, and was afraid to help her. And I talked about other experiences that I've experienced and my kids have experienced. And, uh, and then I started to, and it was published. And then I started to get responses from people, CEOs that I've done business with all these years. You know, I've, I can open practically any doors in corporate Canada because of the work that I've done with all these companies. It's said and, of you, Wes, that, that there's nobody on Bay Street, there's nobody in the financial community, the legal community, who wouldn't return your phone call the same day. So I, I, I'm fortunate enough that I've built a great reputation by the work that I've done, that people respect me and they don't, and it's, and, and they don't attach color to that respect, right? They don't say, well, you should hire this guy, Wes Hall, he's a black guy though, but you should hire him. They go, you should hire Wes Hall. And some people, when they meet me for the first time, they go, oh, you're black, <laughs> right? So, you know, uh, but when that happened, I started to get those calls and they were saying to me, the first call I got was the CEO of CIBC, Victor Dodig. Victor called me up, Victor texted me actually and said, Wes, can I call you? Now I didn't know if it was a call to scold me about what I've said in the article or to offer me encouragement. I didn't know, so he called and he said, Wes, I'm really sorry to have read that. What can I do to help? Then I got a call from Prem Watsa, who is, uh, they call him the Warren Buffett of Canada. He's the most, he's Indian, the most successful entrepreneur in the country probably I've ever seen. And Prem said, Wes, can I come over to your house? He lives in the neighborhood. Sat in my backyard, keep in mind we're social distancing and all that. And he said, Wes, I came here 30 years ago from India. I came with nothing. I built a great company. I knew black people had a hard time, but I didn't get it until I read your article. What can I do to help? All these people were being vulnerable to me. Keep in mind, these are C-suite executives, CEOs of banks, some of the largest companies in the country. They didn't call me up and say, Wes, I have a solution for you. I'm gonna give you some money to this black organization. They said, what can we do to help? And that's how we formed the Canadian Council of Business Leaders Against Anti-Black Systemic Racism. And I said, let's take a business approach to looking at this issue and see whether or not we can use our business minds to solve the problem. And that's how it was formed. The Black North Initiative was formed. And what's the, what's the goal of the Black North Initiative, Wes? So, so the goal, Fred, is not, we're not gonna end racism, but what we can prevent is within my company, for example, if there are obstacles to hiring you because you're white, my job is to remove that because that has nothing to do with your intellect. It has nothing to do with the value that you're gonna to bring to my company. So my job is to remove any impediments to bring in people in my organization to make my organization better solely because of their race, gender, or sexual orientation, okay? So within my own organization, as the leader of the organization, I have to examine my own company to see if there are systemic barriers that exist uh, to people within that, that category. And if there is, I need to do whatever I can to address it. But I also have to recognize the fact that as a business leader, I have power. So when you leave my, my office, for example, and you're driving down the street, are you unnecessarily harassed because of the color of your skin? Mm -hmm. By the police, by average citizens, whatever. And if that happens, I have to make sure that I use my influence to change that. And when your kids go to school, are they treated differently because of the color of their skin? And I should use my influence to do that and so on and so forth, right? So it's not just a matter of saying, let's just protect the people within our company. Let's just collectively use our influence to protect our employees when they leave our companies and now get into society. Wes, you've compared racism to coronavirus. Can you flesh that analogy out for us? Well, you know, the pandemic was, uh, we didn't see it. We can't see the coronavirus. 
right? And uh, it's, but we know that it's there because we're seeing the effect that it's having on our economy and people, right? It's overwhelming our healthcare system, our businesses are shut down, but we can't identify the virus, right? We have to actually test to find out if people have the virus because in a lot of cases, they're asymptomatic. They're carrying this virus around and they don't even know they have it. Racism is the same thing. We have it within us sometimes and we don't even know. That's why they call it unconscious bias, right? Because we may withhold something from someone, but we don't know we're doing it because of what they look like. And so we need to now examine ourselves. We need to test ourselves to see whether or not we have those traits within us. And if we do, we need to take, like, just like the virus, we need to, we now have a shot, we have a vaccine. Now education is what we're gonna use to make sure that we remove those traits from in our own companies. I would love to pursue this further with you because I've read some of what you've written about about why there aren't people who look like you in boardrooms, why there aren't people like you in senior executive positions. Um, maybe, maybe we'll have an opportunity to do that another time. I, I do want to recognize, uh, you've mentioned some of the boards you're on. Um, you're also on the board of uh, Huron University, I believe. Yep. Uh, you're the recipient of the Vice Chancellor's Award from the University of the West Indies. You have an honorary doctorate. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> uh, you're on the Ontario Government's Capital Markets Modernization Task Force. I know that you're a humble philanthropist, but I know the thousands of people who have benefited from your, from your generous donations. You also own some other companies, uh, uh, QM Environmental, where you have 450 employees doing environmental and industrial service uh, provision. You own a company called Titan Supply. You even own a big hotel in St. Lucia, which I think <laughs> is wonderful. But I'm, I'm going through that, Wes, because there are people listening who are waiting, saying, when are they going to talk about Dragon's Den? <laughs> so, <That's, yeah. laughs> so I wanted to leave us a minute to do that. Uh, when did you find out you're a new dragon? Well, you know, I've been a fan of the show for ever, right? It's the 16th season, by the way. And by the way, uh, you know, Fred, I came here at 16, right? I was the number 16 on the McLean's uh, top most powerful list. And I'm on the 16th season of Dragon's Den. So I like that. I like the 16 thing. It's been working for me. <laughs> but but I've been a fan of the show for many years. And um, I never really thought that one day they would knock on my door and go, hey, would you like to be on the show? And there's a process, obviously, to, be, to being on a show. First of all, you, you must have money, right? Because you're, they're asking you to invest in, and, and, and build entrepreneurs. You must have done some interesting things in your life uh, as well. And, um, and also, you, you have to have a personality, right? You can't just go on there and just sit there like a log and say, no, yes, no, yes, right? So, so you have to have all those traits for them to ask you. So they asked me. And when they asked me, I can tell you that it was the most nervous call that I've had because I'm like, I don't think I'm going to do this. No, thank you. I don't think so. But I was talking to a good friend of mine and he said to me, Wes, have there been a black person on that show before? No, they haven't been. Okay. And he said, but you have an opportunity to change the perception of a lot of young black people that go, I can't do that. And now they can do it because they're seeing you doing it. So you have a duty to get out of your comfort zone and say yes. And I said yes. And I had to go through an, uh, an audition process. Oh, really? A real Dragon's Den audition process whereby I'm competing with three or two other dragons that were up for the part. And they had people pitching us. And on camera, we had to be dragons. And, uh, and there were 12 people auditioning for the part. And uh, so I was with three three of us, then three and three and so on. And then they called me up after it was over and said, we would love for you to be the next dragon on Dragon's Den. Great. And here I am. So my job is to create, uh, to create some great entrepreneurs or to help to further you know, their development. And uh, especially for black indigenous people of color entrepreneurs, I would encourage them to try it for the show because they're gonna have someone who's gonna understand them 
who've been where they are and can encourage them to continue. Oh, that's, that's great. Um, I guess my last question on that is, what impact do you hope to have by going on that program? Who, who's your audience? Is it white guys like me, or is it, is it young people of color who, who may benefit from seeing your success, Wes? You know, Fred, I've gotten calls from white executives that says, Wes, I would like for you to sit down with my son because he would be encouraged just by having a conversation with you. White kids, okay? I've had, uh, you know, Indian colleagues of mine sit down with my son. Inspiration doesn't necessarily come from someone who looked like you. All the inspiration that I've had in my career on Bay Street all the way up, none of those people look like me. They didn't look like me. That, do you remember I told you about the 34-year-old uh, general counsel for Canvas Global, how I was impressed by this man and just wanted to be a part of his, uh, his entourage? He, he impressed me. He didn't look like me, but I knew I could learn so much from him. Warren Jensen at CBC Mellon, he didn't look like me. The gentleman who pretend to be my, my boss, yeah. you know, to get the to deal with the bank, he didn't look like me. There are people along our path that can impress us. So I'm, I'm going to be an entrepreneur that can encourage anyone, in my own opinion, Good but question. especially those ones who are looking for the Canadian dream and go, wait a minute, it is possible. It's not a myth because that guy did it. I can do it too, because we're a land of immigrants. We encourage immigrants to come to this country and we go, we're gonna make sure that you can be whatever you want in this country. They need to see representation of that happening. And I'm that representation for them. Wow, that's great. Wes, I want to acknowledge that you're married to Christine and you have five kids between the ages of 10 and 25 or so. Um, Wes, I've got to do some thanks and then I'll come back in just a moment. Okay. I want to thank our viewers for, uh, being part of this program today. I want to thank our friends at Rogers TV who make this possible. The MCC staff, uh, Midland Cultural Center staff who support this program. Our season sponsors are Kathy Bales, Michelle Bichon, and Jeff Holloway of RBC Dominion Securities. Our anonymous program uh, sponsor is thanked again. Uh, I want to thank Kelly and Jasmine at your office, Wes, who've been very supportive and uh, wonderfully helpful. Wes, I have enjoyed this so much. I have looked forward to this since I read a story about you in the newspaper some time ago, and um, all of what I had hoped for has been fulfilled. You are a charming guy, and you've got another fan now, even if he is in Midland. <laughs> well, Fred, I, uh, I'm, I'm glad to have you on board. And if people want to follow me on social media, King of Bay Street is the handle, right? Uh, check out King of, at King of Bay Street on uh, Twitter, on uh, Instagram. And uh, I give encouraging comments to people. I just want to, I'm a happy guy. And I want everyone to, who is affiliated with me, around me, who follows me, to be equally as happy because life is too short. Oh, you're great. Wonderful. Well, this program is, is presented by the MCC. If you have enjoyed this program and would like to support the Midland Cultural Center, go to their website, hit the donate button, and we would be grateful for your support. Uh, Wes, thank you again. Thanks to all of our viewers for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye for now.